Hello and welcome to a live after reading. I'm Tim Niederreiter, and with me today is a returning guest, another fantasy author and fellow podcaster, Edward Willett. Welcome back. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's great to have you. Uh, yeah, so as generally happens, you know, interview, some, talk to somebody a few months apart or years apart. Uh, let people know a little bit about what you've been up to in the, you know, and what sort of stuff you put out there in the world. Okay, well, I'm the, uh, this is like the potted bio that just comes out of me whenever <laughs> I'm asked that question. <laughs> I'm sorry, yeah. It, That's okay. Yeah. Should, uh, should I have the, something to make you swerve, you know? <laughs> I am the award-winning author of more than 60 books of science fiction, fantasy, and nonfiction for readers of all ages. Mm. Uh, my most recent book, uh, I've been writing a series for a DAW book so called World Shapers. And the third book, uh, The Moonlit World, is coming out uh, September 15th. I don't know when this airs, but September 15th, 2020. I presume it's that year still. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It'll actually, be, it'll actually be a few days after this podcast goes live. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and uh, I've just signed a contract to write a, a space opera for Daw Books. So I'm Ooh, looking forward to that. I also have my own publishing company called uh, Shadow Pop Press. And the big thing coming out from there is a... Uh, an anthology uh, featuring guests from the first year of the podcast. At the World Shapers podcast, I talked to science fiction and fantasy authors about their creative process. And uh, I asked my first year guests if they were interested in taking part and got a lot of positive response mm -hmm. and did a successful Kickstarter earlier this year. And so Shapers of Worlds, in fact, I got my physical copies of the Kickstarter edition just today. They're gorgeous. And uh, that's yeah, I the cover looks good. Yeah, and it looks even better in, in print. Oh, I'm sure it does. <laughs> <laughs> and the uh, the ebook will be coming out September 22nd, and the print uh, commercial print release will be in uh, mid November. So that's coming up. And what else do I do? That's kind of the biggies. <laughs> that's a lot of stuff, though. <laughs> it is a lot of books, stuff. a podcast, all this stuff. Yeah, anthologies. And you I know. do editing and mentoring, and that as it comes along. So yeah, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I. I get kind of swamped just trying to do one writing career, you know, I, I, I mean, I, <laughs> and one podcast, but, uh, and my podcast is, but a little, a wee fish, you know, in the pond, but, uh, well, we're glad to have you here anyway. And with, uh, this third world shaper book coming out, um, so how does this series progress? Cause obviously you got, you got crafting, creating worlds, is a bit is a bit, well, it's a big part of a lot of fantasy, but more on the author side than on the character side, right? <laughs> well, the kind of the whole premise of it is it's a bit like authors living inside the worlds mm -hmm. that they create. And uh, I came up with the idea literally because I wanted to be able to write all kinds of different books within a mm -hmm. single overarching framework. Uh, and I always compare it to uh, you know, the what I think is the greatest uh, storytelling concept anybody ever came up with, which is Doctor Who, Ooh, which yeah. allows you any story in time and space and anything. And because Alternate reality is anything you yeah. can think of, yeah. And you can contradict yourself left, right, and center because the timelines can change. So <laughs> <laughs> you don't even have to be consistent. It's like it's a just writer's a playground. <laughs> it's action figures, basically. So the great thing about this is that each book is is different and it's uh, my character is not shaping the world she's traveling to other mm. people's shaped worlds okay. so the first world in the first book was very much like ours with some differences like uh, in, in her version of reality uh, the da vinci code was a broadway musical starring hugh jackman which <laughs> i really like to see actually <laughs> that would be pretty good i imagine yeah. <laughs> the second book was a jules verne inspired world the moonlit worlds so it had you know weird airships and submarines and floating islands and things like that and then in this third book uh, which is just out uh, just about to come out the moonlit world my working title in my head for a long time was werewolves and vampires and peasants oh my <sighs> because that's the kind of a world that it is werewolves and vampires and peasants and my characters have to make their way through all that and avoid getting eaten and or uh, turned into a vampire <laughs> uh, nice it, it kind of reminds me well, when you put it like that it kind of reminds me of uh the way they handled the games in Ma magic the gathering but we don't have to go down that route the, because uh the, the, like each set would be set in a different plane at least lately they do that like they're a different world and they and so, and one of them was like the vampires and werewolves one. And it was just kind of funny. That's why I thought about it. I was like, oh yeah, 
They, they do that. <laughs> yeah, and if I get to write a fourth one, it, it's already planned out. It would be a film noir world, so it's like Ooh. gangsters and black. Well, it might actually literally be a black and white world. I hadn't decided yet because <laughs> it's practically it's there, satire at that point, isn't it? There's literally no, uh, you know, no constraints. Well, there's some, but not many on what the these how these worlds can be shaped. So, uh, yeah, it's it's an it's an open-ended concept for sure yeah Sh- kind of shades of that a few moments from uh the geez a wrinkle in time where like they go to the world that's completely flat <laughs> or, yeah. or flatland for that matter <laughs> yeah i read flatland as a kid and i I, had, I read it like it was just an ordinary fantasy novel and i thought that's a really weird world so <laughs> <laughs> and then the, when you were never the same <laughs> yeah <laughs> i've been two-dimensional ever since <laughs> Geez, like a cartoon character. Anyway, um, I could, of course, now a lot of cartoons are 3D. It's, it doesn't even work anymore. Okay, so. <laughs> what, what were you saying? I said, I'm old enough that that joke still works for me. So. Oh, okay, fair enough. I mean, I, there, I, yeah. There were no 3D cartoons when I was a kid. They got, they, it's it's weird how they talk about that, how like the, the 3D cartoons are now the cheaper ones somehow. That's how this happens now because it's easier to animate. Yeah, hand drawn animation is way more work. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I have been delving into, I, I have a, a, one question I want to ask you mainly about, because you, you do a lot of stuff, you know, you wear a, lot, a few hats at least most of them writing related, but you know, that's a lot, it's still a lot of uh, things to juggle. And, uh, I recently discovered some things about habits that I've been really excited about just in my own life. And I'm wondering, I not, I, I know it's kind of a cliche to ask, you know, what are you, what's your writing habits like? Like, <laughs> but the thing I noticed actually in my own life is the stuff that I don't do. That I, that's not directly writing related that I do, I should say, is really vital to making the my craft time more effective. What do you think about that? And do you think there is kind of a sweet spot for balancing how much effort you put into kind of being a normal person as well as a writer? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, I've always got something writing related I'm working mm-hmm. on. And so it's generally whenever I have you know, downtime, I'm just likely to be on my laptop doing mm. something. Um, over the years, I've, I've, I've done a lot of other things. I mean, I'm also a stage actor and uh, I've done, you know, professional theater and, and a lot of amateur theater as well. Nothing like that is happening right now. I've sung in <laughs> choirs. Nothing like that is happening oh, right boy, now. Yeah. <laughs> um, so at the moment, I'm feeling very much just a, a guy that types on the keyboard and then occasionally gets up to you know go shopping or eat food or something um so yeah most of the right now most of the the habits are have changed oh yeah uh to a certain extent the only thing i try to do every day is at least get out and get out of the house and take a walk oh, i think that, that makes sense. that's important although i mostly think about writing while i'm walking <laughs> hey oh, who doesn't i mean <laughs> among writers anyway uh. in, fact, in fact just today i've i've I realized I had a way to fix a problem in this YA book I'm working on. That's I'm going to self-publish or not self-publish. I have my own publishing company. Independently published through your own company. Exactly. And uh, yeah, I was walking and, and uh, breathing hard and I suddenly realized how I could fix a problem. So there you go. Nice. Yeah. I mean, I, I kind of, that's one of the reasons I want, I started wanting to try dictation originally. It was like, you know, I think so much better when I'm walking around and when I'm in front of my computer, it's like I'm a lump of dead, me, you know, I can't do anything right in front of the computer compared to when I'm walking. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that yeah. We always write better in our heads than we do when you have to actually put it down on the on the and screen. And actually, that that turned out it, well. I mean, it's funny because that now that I can dictate and I don't, and I often dictate away from the computer, so I'm not even looking at the words; they don't appear in front of me as I think about them. Well, the 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 draft got a lot sloppier. But it's faster, so it works out in the end. But it's still like this crazy, like, you thought that I thought this would be easier, but it's really not. It's just different. <laughs> I think the guy, I mean, in my podcast, one of the people I talked to is David Weber, the mm. wrote Honor Harrington and all that. He dictates his books because of an accident that uh, shattered his wrists. And so it's very painful for him to type. Yeah. And he so he, he dictates his. And I just talked to somebody else who does it, too. Who was that? Maybe uh, Kevin J. Anderson. I don't know who all. You no, I haven't talked to him. Uh, he definitely oh, does G- that. Yeah. A fellow named Griffin Barber. Oh, okay. Who uh, he and uh, Casey Azell have a book coming out called uh, "Last Ch- Last Chance Angel." No, Second Chance Angel. Mm. And uh, yeah, he he works that way as well. But he does it like when he's 
going from one place to the next, he'll be dictating. Oh, like a car or whatever? Yeah, that's interesting. I think so, yeah. I mean, you, I mean, talking on the phone in a car, it's, I mean, if you have a hands-free, it's it's totally legal. It's, it's, so it makes sense you could dictate in a car, too. I don't know if it was on a car or if it was just on a or walk. Or a bus or, or whatever, yeah. maybe, yeah. I'd have, the bus I'd have to... be a little bit, the bus might be a little bit personal, I don't know. Maybe that's too close for comfort at that point most of the time. I'll I guess know when... how many people are on public transport these days a year. <laughs> I'll know how he did it when I listen to the interview again when I'm doing the editing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, isn't that just how it goes? Yeah. So, uh, I mean, there's all these different ways. I mean, there's just so many ways you can move around. Jeez. Wow. I'm so smart today. So, <laughs> <laughs> there's all these different mo- mo- modes of locomotion people have invented. Anyway, wow. <laughs> yeah. Who knew? Who knew? There are planes, trains, and automobiles. Not to mention feet. Okay. So... Yeah, I've noticed. Ex- well, obviously, exercise is very useful. But I, the weird thing for me is that I, I felt like I've had lived a very unstructured life for the past few years, and I recently changed to have just, just, just a pinch more structure, and it's helped me so much. It's like very little because I, I kind of had to because I, I've, I've had, I haven't had a normal, a normal structure for five or six years, and then the pandemic hit, and unlike most people, whose their structures kind of get shifted or fall apart. I'm like I need to do something different now because I I'm I don't have the the privacy I used to have all the time uh, for various reasons. I think what I've mainly mainly missed was that uh, I'd like to ride out of the house. I'd like to go to a mm-hmm. coffee shop or a, or a pub um, and do some work in the afternoon and in the mornings. And I haven't been able to do that. So being stuck in the house, I think, has I I sometimes feel less creative sitting in my living room than if I can get out somewhere and, you know, get change of scenery while I'm writing. Absolutely. I, I totally get that too. Uh, I like to, I like to write in the local coffee shop. That was, uh, that was all, that was kind of my favorite place to, to at least edit once I started dictating because you obviously can't edit, dictate in a coffee shop anyway. Um, and, and they so are, that's all, a little tricky. They are open, but they have half as many seats and, yeah. Well, and you around feel here we can't even sit down. Yeah. Oh, here we can. But I feel I, you know, if I went and sat in one, people would start to look at you funny because there's so few seats. Why are you taking yeah, that just, one up? And for you're so going to take it up for a couple of hours or whatever. Yeah, least. so it's it's not the same. No, no, that's it's. I think that's maybe the the biggest thing I personally have have lost, which is to say, not much really from from my personal routine, is to go to the coffee shop and just hang out, basically. Uh, and do some some dictation or some writing or editing. I mean, um, yeah. So uh, yeah. Anyway, we we have kind of wandered a little bit, but when it comes to uh, your podcast, you 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 do mostly interviews, correct? Your podcast is basically an, an interview show. It's a very structured show. Okay. Um, I talk to I I'll I'll set it up with an author. I'll find out what book they want to use as an example mm-hmm. of their creative process. Um, when I started it, I thought I would read all those books, but of course, time constraints being what they are, <laughs> I generally just get to delve into them a bit. Um, but uh, then we talk about the, it's an hour long, mm-hmm. uh, and we, we talk about how the author got interested in science fiction fantasy, both as a reader and as a writer, how they started writing, how they broke in professionally. Then we talk about the process focusing on that one specific book. So we'll talk about uh, starting with idea generation and then... Uh, um, outlining and planning and research and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And then the actual writing process, revision process, editing process. And then at the very end, I ask uh, the big philosophical questions. And I keep meaning to put reverb on that <laughs> um, about you know, why do you write? Why do you write science fiction and fantasy in particular? And why do you think any of us write? Why, why does this compulsion to tell stories get some really good answers and, uh, easily fill an hour, and in the case of Os- Orson Scott Card, it filled two hours. Because wow, yeah, I can imagine <laughs> that was a two-parter. And some other authors have gone an hour and a half. I think David Weber, that I mentioned, went on we were about an hour and a half, and Doc, uh, Chuck Gannon was, I think, an hour and a half. But generally, it's around an hour. And uh, I just had such great response from. I mean, these are yeah, these are impressive. These are ma- you know grandmasters, that kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, just in the last couple of months, I've talked to uh, Kelly Armstrong and Kate Elliott and Faith Hunter and uh, Kat Rambo and, you know, and I, there's a few people in there that are earlier on in their careers as well that I talked to. It's not, you know, and I and at this point, I'm getting to the point where publicists are contacting me about having authors on. And I so I've got yeah. some people that way. And I try to get outside the, the ordinary field a little bit. Like I talked to... Uh, 
Lisa Foyles, who's, uh, she wrote a middle grade book, which was quite good, but uh, she's best known for having been one of the kids on Nickelodeon's, um, oh, one of the Nickelodeon programs. I can't remember it off the top of my head now. Uh, sorry, Lisa. Uh, it wasn't what I watched. A little too old for it. Uh, so she was an actress. And so we were able to talk about that side of things. I talked to another fellow, Edward Savio, who's got a really good series out. And his audiobook was narrated by Will Wheaton and shot to number one, a YA series. And he was primarily a screenwriter and made huge amounts of money as a screenwriter. Um, and, you know, so I try to get outside of just the literary the pure, you know, the, the people that I really know because I'm kind of right in the middle of the traditional science fiction and fantasy yeah. publishing world and I've met them at conventions and stuff. At the same time, I do like to talk to the people who I've met at conventions and stuff. So hey, it's kind of doesn't? A, yeah, again, it's a it's that just kind of a mix sense. like that. Yeah. You, you got you got your circles and that's got a good basis to jump from, right? And it, that's one reason I was able to do it was because when I started the podcast, I could immediately go to I mean, four people I knew really well and I knew they would do it. Robert J. Sawyer, John Scalzi, Tanya Huff, and Julie Sharnado. And those that are was, all big names, yeah. That yeah, was a pretty good, good solid good beginning. list to start with, yeah. Oh, and later on it was Joe Haldeman and Tad Williams and Ooh, yeah. people I also knew. And then then after that, you know, it got easier as you had, you could say, well, you can listen to my interview with John Scalzi. And, you know, and yeah, so this, at this point, most people uh, are willing to do it. And occasionally there's people I just can't seem to get hold of and they ignore my emails, but I don't, <laughs> you know, the old hermits, the hermit types. Yeah. Well, it's either that or, you know, the or people big, just don't like email or they're just really busy or they don't like yeah. to do interviews or whatever. I don't, exactly. I don't worry about it. <laughs> I, well, yeah, it's a possible to be, what is it? A digital hermit kind of, or I think there's some, some authors like uh, Matt Wallace did this for a while where he would, he would write for podcasts. This is way back. This is like in 2000, the, the early 2000s when podcasts were really young and he would write fit for podcast fiction, but he would never appear on podcasts. Now he's of course broken that rule a bunch. Cause he's on, he's on with Merle Lafferty all the time on ditch diggers. I would by preference, probably disappear entirely into just writing <laughs> and stuff, but uh, it's not actually possible these days. So. Oh, yeah. And I don't, I, I, that's not quite true. I mean, obviously I have no trouble talking on the, <laughs> on the <Yes>. podcast. <laughs> um, but at the same time, it's, it's sometimes doing my own podcast. I really love doing it. But, you know, every hour that goes into that is an hour. I, maybe I should be writing, I sometimes mm-hmm. think. But. Yeah, no, absolutely. I That's why I, I that's why I kind of un- keep my podcast unstructured. I mean, also, I just find it more fun this way. But I and also because I don't want to edit something that I, I just like the energy you get from a normal conversation, even if it is just over the Internet. Uh, yeah, mine's a bit more of a formal interview, uh, but that's where my, you know, I started as a newspaper reporter and editor mm-hmm. and I've hosted my own TV and radio programs. And I'm told by the people who have been on the podcast that they think I'm a very good interviewer. So, and these are people who've been interviewed by a lot of people. So yeah, that's, <laughs> right, that's, pretty good that's nice to hear. Yeah. Uh, and the other, maybe, I thought it may be crazy thing I do is I do a full transcript of this hour long podcast. I use a uh, transcription service mm. called sonics sonics.ai is the website and it's quite good but i would still say it takes about four hours of editing even in a good recording to to clean it up for that one hour podcast so each podcast is easily taking me i would think five to six hours to actually get up yeah uh, which is why normally i only do it every two weeks but recently i've been trying to do it weekly because of having books coming out uh, and because my guests are piling up. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure. I mean, I don't have personal experience with that. But it is an interesting kind of uh, phenomenon for the more uh, m- the more heavily, I don't know, I guess I should say m- the less improvised style podcast, the more formal podcasts and interview styles. Yeah, and, and I think yeah. I do it because I personally, my personal preference is always to read material. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, I, if I we're going to somebody else's podcast and there was the option of reading the transcript or listening to the podcast, I would probably read the transcript rather than Mm. because I can get through it faster. I can absorb the information faster. It's the same. I hate, like I hate like YouTube. I hate when I'm looking to understand how to do something. I want a YouTube video. Yeah. I want clear printed instructions. I don't want to have to sit through a 20 minute interview with some guy (laughs) showing me how to do something that the instructions would take three minutes to read. So it's just a different style of the way I like to get information. Yeah, and I think that I think the interesting one of the interesting things I don't I don't want to comment on whether this is good or bad. I don't think it's either really, but it is interesting that that's kind of how things are going. You know, the more and more, 
the and educational content especially is audio or visual or video you know there's very little on the internet at least the, the do it yourself stuff that's like the blog the blog posts that are that would teach you stuff i mean i know like even chuck wendig kind of folded up his irreverent you know writing advice blog you know basically it doesn't do a whole lot of that anymore and he still dies a blog it just doesn't do writing advice you know yeah i i know my daughter of course who's 19 is so has no problem with like watching youtube videos to learn how to do something but mm -hmm. to me it just they they annoy me <laughs> no i can I, I totally get your perspective i i'm kind of neutral on it i could do either but i i do i do tend to like I, i'm a little bit younger obviously so, uh so i do pre i actually prefer youtube because it's just i could just have it on in the background and then i pick stuff up but if i actually wanted to learn something in a hurry well then i would uh you know i would definitely be more apt to read something about it so there's, there's just, advantages to both sides yeah and maybe it's because i'm a newspaper guy i always hated uh, television and radio news mm. partly because i knew in print you could put so much more into the story like i would go cover the school board meeting for example at, at the weyburn review when i was working at the weyburn review the meeting would be four hours long i would at least get say 35 or 40 inches of copy the radio guy sat there for four hours for a, if he was lucky, a minute and a half spot, more likely a minute. Mm. And he would have to get one quote from somebody to plug in there. And it would be like one aspect of this four hour meeting. And uh, yeah, so I've always been a print guy. <laughs> yeah, that gives you a pretty shallow pool uh, to pull from if you're the radio guy in that situation. Yeah. I felt sorry for them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you just got to kind of get in and get out. On the other hand, I spent, you know, another two hours writing up the story and they were done. So, you know, there's that. Too. <laughs> yeah, I guess. Uh, and then there's the whole other phenomenon of Twitch, you know, and all these these streaming channels or whatever, where they people just talk for hours and hours. They react to videos or stuff uh, like that. I don't quite understand that. I'm not a huge fan of that kind of thing for the most part. I know some of my friends who do it. And I'm, I'm just like, I, I don't. And I'm, I'm not talking friends that are because I just turned 30 this year. And I'm like. Uh, no, that's, that's, I guess I'm a boomer compared to these people, but some of these people are <laughs> 15 years older than I am. <laughs> All right, each the, to each their own, I guess. Exactly. I, I guess I'm just not, I just didn't make that tech jump when a lot of other folks have. <laughs> anyway. Uh, yeah. So I guess we're a little bit out of time. So remind people what, where they can find your stuff online and what we, sh what, you know, what they should check out from you. All right. Well, my main website is edwardwillett.com, two T's on Willett, W-I-L-L-E-T-T. -T. There's an online store where you can buy autographed books called edwardwillettshop.com. You can also download some eBooks directly from there, which I like because I get all the money if you mm -hmm. do that. Yeah. Um, my, <laughs> my publishing company is Shadowpaw Press, shadowpawpress.com, and that's where Shapers of Worlds is you can get it directly from there. But Shapers of Worlds, the anthology, is also available everywhere. Uh, all the major ebook retailers will have it as of September 22nd, and it will be out in print in mid November. Um, and then uh, The Moonlit World, which I mentioned, is of course out everywhere. It's wide release from Penguin Random House, so you should be able to find that one if you look for it. Uh, let's see. Oh, on social media, I'm on Twitter at eWillett, two T's. Mm -hmm. I'm on Facebook at edward.willett. And I'm on Instagram at Edward Willett Author because somehow I missed that memo about having only one <laughs> <laughs> one name for all of your platforms. Yeah, yeah. I mean, who among us has succeeded at getting all the platforms with the same name? I'm sure someone has. I, I've not met them. I don't think. I was on Twitter pretty early. I did. I barely touched it for years. But uh, so E Willett, I never thought of needing my full name or anything like that. It was mm. just. You know, just something short, and now I kind of wish I had Edward Willett, but I don't. So, ah, uh, yeah, yeah, it's you know, small things they they don't matter, and that on some levels they do. <laughs> oh, and the, the podcast I should mention the podcast oh, is yeah, yeah. Uh, the World Shapers dot com is the website. Uh, it's on Facebook at the World Shapers, and it's on Twitter at the World Shapers. Unlike me, it has the same handle. <laughs> oh, you got that one, yeah. Nailed and all those platforms. So, thanks for being on the show, Edward. Oh, thank you for having me again. It's been, it's been a lot of fun. And as for this podcast, you can find us at mentalsellerpublications.com. You can find uh, my books at timniederreiter.com or mentalsellerpublications.com. But personally, if I were you, I would go check out the new URL that is Tim and then N-E-E-D as in need. That's not how you actually spell my last name, but it's how you say it. And then a writer.com. 
which is where uh, you can you can see my more up to date stuff because it's not podcast related. Anyway, and oh, and that means, and by the way, speaking of up to date, Shadow Prince. This is the sequel to my sec to my epic fantasy novel, Demon Scroll, is out now as of yesterday. <laughs> so go <laughs> to Amazon and check that out. And uh, obviously, w- well, when, when if you if once you supported Ed and gotten checked his work out as well. So thanks for listening, everybody. Have a good week. That tears it.